Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Friday, everybody. All right. Hope everybody's doing well. Go ahead and um, type your first name into chat for me. Thank you very much. All right, very good. So this morning we're going to be finishing up the lab exercise that we started on Wednesday um, about simple staining. Um, before we get to that though, we're going to um, just look at a couple of uh, scheduling details just to keep everybody up to date about what's happening, what's coming up. Uh, first things first though, does anybody have any questions about anything that they wanna talk about? Anything that you've seen in the lecture material that you have a question about or um, any questions about um, anything we've been talking about in the labs? If you do, feel free to just type that right into the chat. Um, we can talk about that. What I'll do in the meantime is I'm just gonna pull up our Blackboard screen so we can look ahead in our schedule. Uh, let's see if I can find this first. Um, let's see. Bear with me just a minute. All right, share a screen. So you should be seeing um, our homepage on Blackboard on your screen. I'm gonna go ahead and click where it says course content in the left-hand menu. And then I'm gonna scroll down and I'm gonna click on week three next week for us, which is the week of the 15th. And here's your to-do list. The most important thing to know for next week is that you have your first lecture exam on Monday. And this exam will cover all of the material that we've been going through in lecture so far. So that includes the introduction to the microbes lecture, history of microbiology, science of microscopy, and the cell, which are the subjects you're looking at this week. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you get your notes um, in order this week, because remember you can have your notes next to you um, if you need them during the lecture exam. Uh, so the lecture exam takes place on Monday, the 15th. It's gonna be available to you starting at eight o'clock in the morning. So you can take it as soon as eight o'clock in the morning um, up until 8 p.m., which is the um, the late the latest time that you can submit it. So sometime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., you'll want to sit down and take this lecture exam. Um, you um, you must complete it once you start it. So it's similar to a lecture quiz that way, um, and you must submit it by 8 p.m. Uh, in order to get full credit, in order for it to be on time. Now, note that it will stay open past 8 p.m. So you will be able to keep going past 8 o'clock p.m., but it may be counted late. Uh, it's a really good idea to go back between now and Monday and take a look at your lecture quizzes again, especially at the questions that you might have missed. Um, so you're sure to update your notes with the correct information and so on. They're, they are very nice review material, these lecture quizzes. So again, you are allowed to use your notes from lecture during the lecture exam, but that's the only thing you're allowed to use. You are not allowed to Google any questions. You're not allowed to use any other source materials, books and reference texts and things like that. 
And you're certainly not allowed to receive any assistance from another person during the exam. Um, all right. Um, I will just quickly also say there are other, there's other work next week to do, of course. Uh, there's one lecture topic next week, and that's prokaryotes. Um, so that's uh, available to you as a series of lecture videos. And of course, once you finish that lecture on YouTube, you're going to want to complete the lecture quiz as usual. And we will meet for lab as usual. So that means even on Monday, we're going to be meeting for lab. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we will meet for lab as usual. Our topics next week are aseptic technique and a differential staining procedure called gram staining. And of course, you'll have lab homework to do next week as well. So that's coming up next week. Don't, um, don't get nervous about the lecture exam. Don't let it um, give you a lot of anxiety. Um, you've been preparing for this. You've been watching the videos. You've been taking notes. You've been completing these lecture quizzes. Many of you have been doing very well on the lecture quizzes. Lots of five out of fives on those. Um, remember, this is only a lecture exam. So there's no laboratory material on this exam. Anything that we talk, we've talked about during the laboratories, I will examine you on separately. Those will be the laboratory practical exams. But this exam on Monday is just about lecture. So again, if you get your notes in order between now and then, now and Monday, um, you'll be in fine shape. Uh, you have 90 minutes to complete the exam once you start. And um, just like with the other time settings on this exam, if you need to go past 90 minutes, you can. It's just that you might be marked late. Um, you might lose points, in other words, for late submission. Um, I will tell you that historically, students typically finish this exam in about 30 to 60 minutes. So depending on the student, some students are just very fast and they finish it in about 30 minutes. But most students who have taken this exam finish it between 30 and 60 minutes. So you should have plenty of time. Time should not be a barrier at all for you. So um, in terms of the number of questions on the exam, I can't really tell you that, but um, I, I can't remember precisely, but um, Again, you should be able to finish the questions um, with no trouble in that 90 minute period. So it's a really good idea, as I said, to go back through your lecture quizzes that you've had so far. Um, remember, you, you, have, uh, you can tell what you got right, you can tell what you got wrong when you go back into them. And you can also see what the correct answer would have been. You can also see if I made any comments for you. Um, you'll be able to see those. And um, if you misunderstood something or if you had something incorrectly in your lecture notes, you can fix it in your lecture notes. So you'll be ready when you sit down to take the exam. Any, any questions about the lecture exam on Monday? Um, I will also say, I recognize that some people have very um, busy uh, schedules. Um, if you don't have a block of time on Monday between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. to take this exam um, because of work or because of other commitments, um, please let me know. Um, and what we'll do is we'll figure out, you know, maybe you can take it a little bit later or maybe a little bit earlier. I had a student uh, just last semester who used to take lecture exams at six o'clock in the morning um, because he had to get to work. So. Um, if that's a problem for you, let me know, and we will figure out what time slot um, works for you. All right, very good. All right, um, and of course this week, this week you had a quiz on the history of microscopy and the science of microscopy, and that was due, oh, sorry, you had two quizzes, history of microscopy, science of microscopy, that was due on Wednesday, 
And then you have the cell quiz that's due tonight by midnight. Be sure to get those in. And of course you have lab questions to do this week that are due by Sunday at midnight. Again, a nice review for you um, moving forward. Um, remember, I said this last time, but I'll remind you again. When you do these lab questions, because you are allowed to take as much time as you want on those, and because you can go in and out as many times as you want on those, when you finish, you have to click the button at the bottom that says um, something like finish and submit or complete and submit. There's one that says, oh, there's one that says save and exit. And then there's another button that says save and submit. You have to click on the submit button <laughs> for your finished homework to come to me. If you don't do that, if you just click save and exit, what I get through Blackboard is just that you're still taking it. You're still finishing your homework. So be sure to submit your lab homework <laughs> when you finish up. All right, very good. Um, Emily's asking a great question. Will we need to identify slides for the exam? Now, anything in lecture, any of the um, images and things that were in the lectures where I was using an image to maybe show you something or um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, anything that is, shows up in lecture is fair game for the exam. And so sometimes what will show up on a lecture exam is um, something like, um, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, I might ask about um, a structure that we talked about in lecture. And, and I might pull up a picture that's similar to one we looked at in lecture. And I might say, what's this thing here that the arrow is pointing at? But only if we talk about it in the lecture. So that is fair game. Um, again, these are typically multiple choice questions and short essay questions. So for the multiple choice, it might be um, fill in the missing term in this sentence. Um, uh, tell me if this is true or false. And if it's false, please tell me, you know, give me a corrected version of the statement. Um, I might ask you to uh, match things um, similar to what you saw on the history lecture quiz. Um, I might ask you to tell me which of these scientists in this list believed in this theory. <laughs> you know, I might ask you to match things. So the format on the lecture exam looks a lot like what you've done on the quizzes so far. Oh, Lacey's asking a question. If, if you used your textbook, if you used your textbook and you added things in to your lecture notes from your textbook, that's absolutely fine. That's absolutely fine. What I'm saying about materials that you can use during the exam is I only want your notes with you. I don't want you to have a stack of books. I don't want you to have, I don't want you to be flipping through your textbook. I want your notes, all right? Part of the exercise, part of the learning exercise for taking an exam this way is to get us all practicing taking a really good set of notes. Yeah, we need to always practice how we take our notes during our lectures um, and our labs and um, how you take notes from a textbook, things like that. So if you wrote some things into your lecture notes that were from the textbook, that's fine. It's still your lecture notes, right? If you Googled something during while you were watching a lecture video and you wrote that information down in your lecture notes, that's fine. Those are your lecture notes. But your lecture notes are the only thing you should have by your side while you take, um, while you take the exam. Good question, Lacey. Any other questions? All right, very good. So I'm gonna move us forward now and uh, go back into the slide set that we were looking at on Wednesday about this process that we call simple staining. If you remember, we, 
We talked through some vocabulary when we were together. We talked about the differences between a uh, simple and differential staining. We talked about what a smear is. We talked about what fixation means, heat and uh, chemical fixation. We talked about chromophores and direct and negative staining. And that brought us up to this slide here. And I was finishing up last time talking about the um, hazard uh, diamond on the front of this ethanol bottle just to remind us that, um, that we always have to be aware of the things that we're handling in the micro laboratory and in any laboratory um, to keep ourselves safe. So we're gonna watch this video together for the next uh, about 15 minutes. And it's gonna walk us through making a smear from bacteria, heat fixing that smear, and then doing a simple staining procedure with that stain I mentioned earlier called methylene blue. And we'll also take, um, uh, when we finish the video, what we'll do is we'll take some time to take a look at some slides, some actual slides and um, get some practice, not only examining them, but identifying the different shapes of bacteria that we can see on those slides. But first we'll uh, watch this video together we start any of our work in the laboratory, remember that we have to disinfect the work surface. The two most common disinfectants used in laboratories for this kind of disinfection are alcohol and bleach. We use an alcohol solution of anywhere from 60 to 90%. Typically it's about 70%. And we use a 10% Sorry, I'm gonna try again here. We start any of our work in the laboratory. Remember that we have to disinfect the work surface. The two most common disinfectants used in laboratories for this kind of disinfection are alcohol and bleach. We use an alcohol solution of anywhere from 60 to 90%. Typically it's about 70% and we use a 10% bleach solution. Both of those things are rapidly bactericidal. They will kill bacteria on surfaces very quickly. And that's why they're so effective. So with the squirt bottle like this, we simply um, apply the disinfectant to the surface and then clean it off Make sure the surface is nice and dry before you get yourself going with your work. Remember too that you have to make sure you have all of your materials gathered before you begin. And first and foremost, we want to glove up. Um, these are nitrile gloves that I'm wearing in this picture. Um, I put this picture in because I want you to see that these gloves are a little too big for my hands. You want to wear gloves in the laboratory that are not too tight or too loose. And generally speaking, when you look at the back of your hand, which is what you're looking at in this picture, you should be able to move your fingers and your thumb around and not get these very large um, folds. You don't want the glove to have a lot of extra space. You want it to fit against your skin, but you don't want to wear a tight glove. It's not good, it will cut off your circulation. Um, on the palm side of my hand, you can see there's just a, there's a lot of extra room in this glove. You can see the folds um, on my palm and along my fingers. But um, unfortunately, beggars can't be choosers. And right now, this is the only size glove that I have available. Okay, so I've gathered the supplies that we're going to need today in order to make a smear of bacteria for staining. And what you're seeing on the desktop here I've got a bowl um, that is used only for staining purposes. Uh, I've got a dropper bottle with methylene blue in it, which is a very commonly used simple stain. I've got a, um, a clothespin here, and uh, I'll show you what we do with those while we're staining. I've also got my inoculation loop. Uh, this is an instrument that we use 
very often in the microbiology lab. It has an aluminum handle, and then it has a wire. And at the end of the wire, you can't really see it here, but at the end of the wire, there's a loop. Um, when you dip this wire into a culture, into a broth culture, you will pull up some of that culture within the loop. If you remember when you were a little kid and you used to play with soap bubbles, you would stick that little wand down into the soap bubble solution and you would pick up some of the solution inside the loop. And that's what we're doing uh, with an inoculating loop as well. Over on the right hand side over here, you can see an incinerator. This is an electric device that gets hot enough to allow us to uh, sterilize the wire on an inoculating loop. Now in this test tube, I'm holding um, a nutrient broth culture. Um, it has bacteria growing in it. So I would have just pulled this out of the incubator and I'm now ready to examine cells that are inside the culture. Anytime you pull a broth culture out of the incubator, one of the indications that you have been successful in growing bacteria is the cloudiness that you see in the broth solution. The broth starts off very clear. You would be able to um, hold a, a piece of paper behind it and read the writing on the paper. Um, but obviously this solution is no longer clear uh, because it has cells growing in it. Now, it's really important that when you're using an incinerator in a microbiology lab, that you go ahead right at the start of your day and plug that thing in. These do take a few minutes to warm up and they have to be red hot in order to work correctly. So I always plug the incinerator in right away when I get into the lab and I'm ready to start making slides. Note too that a lot of incinerators have two settings. They've got a low heat setting and a high heat setting. Now I happen to be using the high heat setting today, but uh, depending on the incinerator, the low heat setting might be just fine. Um, incinerators can get very hot. And sometimes having the incinerator on the desktop on high is just unbearable because it's radiating so much heat that it's making you hot sitting, you know, two and three feet away from it. So um, the reason the low setting is there is because some incinerators will get plenty hot on the low setting. So when we're ready to sterilize the loop, it's the wire portion of the loop and not the aluminum handle that we're going to be putting into the incinerator. You can see that there is a metal plate on the front of the incinerator and then there's a ceramic tube that runs down into the device. Um, we're going to place the wire as far as it will go down into that tube for the purposes of sterilization. This, um, this picture is very blurry because I wanted to uh, focus in on the loop as it sits way down in the back of the incinerator. You can see that the ceramic surface actually will glow red hot when the incinerator is ready to go. And the wire, at least the end of the wire, where the loop is, is also glowing red hot. You need to achieve that in order to achieve sterilization. You've got to get that metal red hot. Now, as soon as you withdraw the inoculating loop from the incinerator, you're, the red hot color of the metal is going to go away. It's going to go right back to its regular color. But understand that this wire is burning hot right now. So the very last thing you would want to do is take this loop at this moment and put it into your broth culture because you will sizzle that broth culture and you'll kill a whole lot of bacterial cells. So instead, you just hold the loop in your hand and count to about 20. Just do a little mental count in your head to about 20. That's enough time for that loop to cool off um, to be safe to put into your culture solution.
So remember, when it's time to take out the culture solution with our inoculating loop, we want to make sure that we're handling the culture tube correctly. Remember, always with a gloved hand, we don't handle any culture materials with our bare hands. And we're going to always remember, once we open a container that has pure culture on it or in it, we want to tilt it so we make sure not to allow any microbes to accidentally fall in. When you take the cap off, you want to keep the cap in your fingers. Don't put it down on the desktop. Um, you're going to keep the tube at an angle while you draw out your specimen. You can see I've got the loop here. Um, I'm not just sticking the loop right under the um, surface of the liquid. I'm going down about halfway into the tube. Um, that's just good practice. It's also good practice not to allow the handle of the inoculating loop to get too far into that tube. And that's because, if you recall, we didn't sterilize this handle. We sterilized the wire, or at least the bottom half of the wire. So try not to put any more of that handle into your culture tube than absolutely necessary. Right. Once you have culture on your inoculating loop, can place that culture onto your glass slide and you'll see I'm doing circle movements getting ever wider and basically spreading that liquid out across the center third of the microscope slide. Of course we have to let the culture material dry and all I've done here is I've set the slide down on a piece of paper towel. Um, notice that the slide is labeled um, Typically, when you're making a slide that you're, you plan on just looking at and then throwing away, um, the labeling is not important. But if you're making multiple slides, which is often what you're doing, you're going to want to label them. And certainly, if you want to save the slide, if you're going to produce and stain a slide and you want to save it, you're going to want to label it. So I have my initials. I have the date that the slide was made. I have the name of the organism that's growing in my culture, and that is uh, capital B for the genus Bacillus, and the species name is Subtilis. Um, and then finally, I wrote MB on this slide because I'm gonna be using methylene blue as my stain. The next step in preparing a smear for staining is critically important. That step is called heat fixation. We're doing a couple things when we heat fix a smear of bacteria or other microbes. Number one, we're going to warm up the surface of the slide so that the lipid in the membrane of those cells will stick to the surface of the slide. This is such an important step and unfortunately sometimes it gets overlooked. If you try to stain a bacterial smear that has not been heat fixed, when you go to stain that smear, you're going to wash the cells right off the slide. So we heat fix to adhere the cells to the slide. We also heat fix to kill the cells. Now the stain, the staining procedure, the stain itself is going to kill the cells too. So it's kind of a double check that we've got the cells um, killed and stuck to our slide. Now, one other thing to know about heat fixing, and that's this, you never heat fix your slide until it's dry. So once you put your bacterial cells onto your slide and spread them out, you've got to allow that slide to dry completely before you heat fix it. And that's because if you lay a damp slide, a wet slide, against this hot incinerator like this, you run the risk that you're going to aerosolize that liquid very quickly and you're going to send bacteria up into the air. And you don't want to do that. So make sure the slide is 100% dry and then pick the slide up, uh, preferably with a clothespin. And this is the clothespin I showed you at the beginning of the video this morning. Um, the clothespin will allow me to hold this slide against the hot aluminum surface of my incinerator and 
keep my fingers far away. <laughs> so you simply lay the glass slide right to the surface of that incinerator and leave it there for approximately 20 to 30 seconds. Once your slide is heat fixed, it's time to apply the stain. I'm applying a drop of methylene blue again to the center of the slide because I know that's where I placed my cells. Now, don't be stingy with stain. <laughs> you want to make sure that that whole smear that you took the time and trouble to make is covered with that stain. So put the stain onto the slide so that it makes a nice puddle. All right? Stain is not expensive. So go ahead and apply it generously. And that way you're ensured that all of the cells will get exposed to that stain. Typically when we're doing a simple staining procedure like this one where we're applying that one stain and then we're going to rinse it off, it will stay on the slide for about 60 seconds. Now every stain is a little bit different and sometimes uh, it'll be a little bit longer or a little bit shorter, um, but generally it takes about a minute to stain a smear like this. Once that time is up, you get your stain waste container like that bowl I showed you a minute ago. You're going to take that container, you're going to hold your slide over it, and you're just gently going to rinse the excess stain off of the slide. Now, notice you don't see a big blue area on my slide, even though it's been stained. You're not staining the slide, you're staining the cells on the slide, and you're not going to see where those cells are until you put that slide under the microscope. Once it's rinsed, you can allow the slide to dry. Just one more word about stain. All of the stains that we use in the microbiology laboratory have to be disposed of correctly. They have to be collected into a waste container and treated as hazardous waste. So the reason that we work in these containers, these stain bowls or staining trays, is because we want to be able to collect this waste stain and keep it from going down the drain. You can allow the slide to just air dry, but you can also use this material here, which is called bilbis paper. This paper is just a, it's a thick, absorbent piece of paper, and it comes in um, pads. So you use one of these pieces to just blot your damp slide um, and get it prepared for observation under the microscope. All I've done here is folded the bilbis paper over and I'm just going to gently press it down onto the surface of the slide so that I wick up as much of that moisture as possible. It's important to know that you don't have to get a microscope slide completely dry after you've stained it. Um, if it's a little bit damp, that's not a problem. You don't want to rub the slide. You just want to blot it gently. You're trying to get up as much of the excess moisture as you can before you examine it. All right. Does anybody have any questions about what you saw? Do you have to put a cover slide over that after or oh, no? Great, great question. No, you don't need a cover slip on this. The only time you need to use a cover slip is if you've got a liquid material on the slide. You don't even, uh, well, I won't even say that because that's confusing. Um, anytime that you're examining a volume of liquid on a slide that you're not allowing to dry, um, you need a cover slip. Um, it's too difficult to look through a drop of fluid without compressing it with a slip. Um, but if you're do using a dry preparation, like a smear, a stained smear, you don't have to put a cover on it. 
um, which is nice. Um, it's just one fewer step that you have to take. Good question. Now, once that slide that I've just stained, once that's all dry, once I've blotted it and it's all dry, that I can just take it right to the microscope and I can examine it. Um, remember, once I get over to the scope with my slide that I just made, my gloves come off. I take my gloves off because I'm going to handle the scope now. And the scope is not something I'm going to routinely disinfect. So we don't wear gloves uh, when we examine things under the microscope. Um, that slide, the, the cells on that slide are no longer a danger to me. Not that I'm going to touch them <laughs> while I examine it or anything. But remember, they're dead now. They're dead and I have stuck them to the slide and I have stained them. So they're not a danger to me. And after I examine my slide and I'm all done with it, I can save it if I want because I have stained it. So if I wanna show it to somebody else, if I need to show it to a physician or if I need to show it to anybody else, um, I can save it. Um, but when I'm done with it, I'm gonna put it in the glass waste. Remember that box, that big cardboard box where glass goes once we're done with it. I don't need to autoclave this slide. Yes, it did touch culture material, but the way I handled it, the way I processed it, I killed that culture material. I killed it when I heat fixed it, and then I killed it again when I stained it. So that slide is not hazardous. I don't need to autoclave it. It can go right into the glass waste container. We don't put microscope slides into the regular trash because they tend to break and we don't want anybody to accidentally get cut um, when they're emptying the trash. Um, only a, one other thing I wanted to mention, and you may not have even caught it in the video. Um, I made that video over the summer. Um, you might have noticed that the date on the slide said June something. Um, so um, that there's that. And also the other thing I wanted to mention was I, I misspeak. I misspoke in the video. Um, I said, when the slide gets heated up, the lipid in the membrane melts a little bit and sticks the cells to the slide. Um, remember, it's the proteins that are really adhering the cell to the slide. It's the proteins that are sitting in the lipid <laughs> in the membrane. <laughs> so I misspoke just a little bit in that video. Um, it's all about protein. When you heat proteins up and you denature them, um, everything gets a little sticky and um, they will adhere to that glass um, and keep the slides in place while we're staining them. All right, very good. Let's take a look at some slides now. So on this slide, you are looking at a smear of Bacillus subtilis, which remember is the organism that I had on my slide as I was heat fixing it and staining it. Bacillus is the genus name and subtilis is the species name. Remember, we always use a capital letter for the genus and we use a lowercase letter for the species name. Every living organism on planet Earth has a genus and a species. So we always um, use the same sort of formatting when we talk in scientific names. Remember too, anytime you write down a scientific name, you have a couple of options. You can either put both of those names, the genus and the species, you can put those in italics or you can underline each of those names individually. That is the proper and correct way to write out a scientific name. We often, we often take the genus name and we uh, shorten it to just that one beginning letter. So I can write out Bacillus subtilis or I can write capital B period subtilis. That's a perfectly correct way to write that name. So on this slide, 
on this slide, we are using the 100X lens, the oil immersion lens. So we have a thousand X total magnification. And remember, even though we can see bacteria under the 40X lens, it's the 100X lens that's gonna give us the best detail. Now, I wanna remind people that, um, because this was an issue on the quiz, for, um, one of the quizzes for some of you, when I say you can see these cells in detail, you, you can see them in reasonable detail. You can tell how big these are. You can tell what shape they are, but you cannot see individual molecules in this cell. So I can't tell if um, this cell has um, a peptidoglycan cell wall around it or an S layer around it. All I know is the approximate size and the approximate shape. So methylene blue stains things blue, makes sense. I want you to notice that uh, methylene blue is a basic dye. Remember we said most of the stains that we use in microbiology are basic, not acidic, although we do have some that are acidic. And remember a basic stain has a positive chromophore in it. It has a positive colored ion in it. So that colored ion is gonna stick to any negatively charged cell components. The positive ion sticks to the negative material in the cell, including things like the DNA molecule, which has an overall negative charge. Proteins have an overall negative charge. So that's why the dye sticks to the cells. Now, when you look at all of these cells on this slide, it's, it's, um, it's hard to tell where exactly a single cell is, isn't it? Because there's a lot of clumping here. That's very, very common on a smear. You have to search around a little bit and look for what you think is one cell. Because a lot of times with bacteria, they tend to associate with each other. They tend to sort of group together on smears. Actually, that can be a feature that helps us identify certain bacteria, the way they behave in culture, like how they arrange themselves in culture. On this slide, I can see an individual cell in a couple of places. I can see an individual cell right here. I can see an individual cell right here. I can see another one right here. I can also see places where the cells have lined up with each other head to tail, like right here. There's probably two cells right here that are lined up behind each other. I can see more lining up in other parts of the slide. Right here, for example, is like a chain of cells. And these cells have lined up head to tail. That just happens to be an arrangement that the cells tend to get in when they're in culture. Remember, they live in a population, they live in a community. And like all communities, they tend to show certain behaviors. Um, now, when I look at um, these individual cells, I can tell that these cells have a certain shape. These are rod shaped cells. If you look at this cell right, uh, let's see, right here, for example, this is an elongated cell. This is what we would call a rod shape or a bacillus shape. Both of those words mean the same thing. All right, now take a look at this slide. This one was not stained with methylene blue, but a, a simple stain called crystal violet. I think you can tell the cells are just a little darker. They're more of a purple than a blue. Remember, this is methylene blue, so it, it has sort of a bluish uh, look to it. And this is crystal violet. It just has a darker color associated with it. Once again, I'm looking at rod-shaped cells here. Now, when I look, I can see a chain right here of cells. I can see another chain over here, although it's a bent chain. These cells like to line up one behind the other. I can see an individual cell right here. Here's another one right here. But most of these are chains of cells. So in other words, this line right here is not one cell. 
It's a chain of cells. How do I know? Because I can see much, much shorter cells on here. I can see this one, for example. All of these cells are gonna be approximately the same size. So whatever is the smallest on the, the smallest length is the single cell. And these are just chains of cells lined up head to tail. Again, this is a feature of bacillus. They like to get in chains. Now, this is a different organism. We are under the exact same magnification here. We're under the 100X lens. So we're at a thousand X total magnification. And look at how big the cells are compared to these. We have these cells, we have these cells. You can really see the chains on this slide. In fact, it's really hard to see one cell except for down here. I have one cell right here. I have another one right next to it. This, these cells are enormous. This is also a bacillus organism, but this one is called Bacillus megatherium. I love that name because the mega part really makes sense. This is an enormous bacterium. These rods are about four or maybe five or six micrometers in length. So that's pretty big for a bacterial cell. Now this one was stained with yet another simple stain called spore stain. Now you can see most of what you see in each one of these cells, each one of these rods is purple. But on many of them, there's a circle in the middle of the cell that stains pink. Can you see that? Those are spores that are starting to form inside these cells. So this stain, the spore stain, when you use it, will turn anything that is a cell, anything vegetative, purple, and anything that's a spore, pink. So you get to see if your culture is starting to sporulate. Now, this culture is only just beginning to sporulate. How do I know? Because I don't see any spores already formed. I don't see any that are all pink. I, I see all purple and pink. So these spores are still forming inside of the cell. But remember, cells sporulate, bacteria sporulate when they get stressed out. And one of the biggest reasons that bacteria experience stress is because they are drying out. That's number one. Number two, they are losing nutrients. They, there's no nutrients around. There's no food or food is running low. And number three, the waste material that all of these living cells are secreting, it's getting to be a high levels. So this culture that these cells came out of is probably old. Now, old cultures, anything after about two days is considered an old culture. So these cells have probably been in the incubator for maybe three or four days. And they are, the culture's getting old, the cells are getting stressed, and they're starting to sporulate. So let's just review for a minute what the shapes are of bacteria and archaea. Remember, bacteria and archaea are each in their own domain. There are three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The first two are the prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, single-celled, no organelles. So both bacteria and archaea have a similar size and a similar range of shapes. And this slide is nice because it shows us not only the different shapes, but it shows us the shapes in relation to each other. So we can get an idea of size too. Up at the top is the spherical shape. That's the caucus. The singular word is caucus and the plural is cocci. 
If I skip down to this one right here, this is a rod shape, like the ones we've looked at so far this morning. Most people call them rods, but you can also call this shape a bacillus shape. Now, in between these two, there's what's listed as a coxobacillus. And that's pretty obvious why, because it's halfway between a coccus shape and a rod shape. Don't worry too much about the coccobacillus shape. It's actually quite uncommon. This shape down here is often sort of casually referred to as a comma shape. You see this in an organism called Vibrio. So um, it's also sometimes referred to as a Vibrio shape. It's similar to a rod. It's pretty easy to get these confused with rods, as you can imagine, but it has a definite bend in it when you see it on a slide. Now, the last two are very hard to distinguish from each other. And when you're learning, I would not expect you to be able to distinguish these two, but we'll talk about the differences. The first one is called a spirillum, and the second one is called a spirochete. Now the, um, the plural for spirillum is spirilla, and the plural for spirochete is spirochetes. Now what's the difference? Well, the spirillum tends to have fewer twists and turns in it, and it tends to be shorter overall. The spirochete has many more twists and turns and tends to be longer overall. Now, in terms of relative size, a bacillus or a rod in bacteria tends to be one to two micrometers long. Remember, there are a thousand micrometers in one millimeter. So one to two micrometers long. That megaterium cell we saw a minute ago, that one was probably four or five micrometers long. So a caucus is typically about a one half to one micrometer across. So you can see the spirillum and the spirochetes, they, they are significantly longer than those other cells. Now, before I keep going, does anybody have any questions? Any questions about shape names? Most of what we see in a microbiology lab are cocci and rods. You do see spirochetes. You will occasionally, depending on where you work, <laughs> see spirilla and uh, vibrio shape, comma shape. But uh, the vast majority of the shapes that we see in a, in a working microbiology lab are cocci and rods. Okay, take a look at this next slide. I'm looking under the microscope here, of course. This is actually a wet mount. I'm under the high dry lens. I'm under the 40X objective lens here. So I'm at a total magnification of 400. You can tell that there are bacteria on this slide. Now this is a, not a smear though. This is not a smear that I have stained with a simple stain. This is a wet mount. So this is similar to what we talked about last time. The reason the cells are purpley blue is because I put a drop of stain next to the cover slip and it got drawn under. So this is called a wet mount with stain. I just want you to notice what the cells look like here. All right. Obviously, um, while we're learning, it would be really hard to tell much about these cells at 40x we would wanna go up under the oil immersion lens to take a good look at them and see their shape and so on. But you can see them here. I want you to see those. Here they are under the 100X lens. So again, this is a wet mount and I've put a drop of stain on it. 
under the 100x lens, you can, you can start to see the shape of these purple cells. You can also tell that there are some other things on this slide, right? There's all kinds of other debris on this slide. Of course there is, it's a wet mount. This didn't come, um, this isn't a pure culture. This, um, this could have come from um, an environmental sample or, or maybe this came from um, um, some other material that um, I'm evaluating just for the presence of bacteria. It's not a pure culture. You can see these cells though. You can see them and you can see their shape. What shape do you see? What shape do you see there? What do you think? Circular, Circular right? And what do we call that? What, it, what is that spherical round shape called? The coccus. Co right, good. It's coccus or cocci. So a coccus is one of them. And if we see lots of them, we call them cocci. Remember some organisms that have that shape, have it the shape in their name, <laughs> which can be helpful. Staphylococcus is a coccus. Streptococcus is a coccus. Enterococcus. So sometimes the name gives the shape away, which is nice. All right, so again, you can tell that these are circles. You can tell that they're cocci, but it's not super, super evident. I mean, you'd have to really sort of examine it. Compare that to this. This is a stained smear. Wet mount with a little bit of stain, stained smear. Look at how much easier it is to see these cells. This is why we bother making stained smears. These are just much easier to examine. These circular shapes are just much easier to see. They're much darker. They've taken up much more stain than this wet mount. So again, cocci, they're circles. Well, they're spheres because remember they are three-dimensional cells. Now, again, a lot of them are clumped together, but if I sort of look around on my slide, I can find individual ones, or at least I can see individual ones. So I can get an idea about how big they are. This is a stained smear. It was stained with methylene blue. Here's another stained smear. We're under the 100X lens still. So we're at a thousand X total magnification, which is again, the ideal magnification for looking at smears. Now, this one obviously has a very different color. This is a simple stain called saffronin. I have the name down here in the notes section. Saffronin gives this lovely sort of fuchsia pink color. It's a reddish pink color. Now this one, they really look clumped, don't they? They really look clumped. This is probably an individual coccus right here, but it's really hard to find individual ones on this particular smear. Most of them are clumped up like this. This is actually a characteristic feature of this particular bacterium. This is Staphylococcus. This is a species of Staphylococcus and Staph loves to clump up in culture. So when you see this, and they're often referred to as grape-like clusters, just big old clusters of these circular cells. This is a feature that's very common for Staphylococcus. Here's another smear that was stained again with saffronin. So you get that nice pink red color. Now these look different from any of the ones we've looked at so far. These are very, very narrow, very um, slivery sort of rods. And they are also in chains. This one is a nice chain to look at. I know again, it's hard to see 
but this chain probably has one, two, three, four, five or six cells in it. Hard to find individual cells on this slide, but if you look right here, you can see two rods head to tail. So these are rods stained again with saffron in. Now, this is another preparation that has been stained with saffron in. It looks different though, doesn't it? The background has a lot of color to it. We're not used to seeing that. You know, the background for a stained, a uh, simple stained slide, especially if it's a direct stain that stains the cells, we expect it to be this white color. You can see that here, you can see that here. But on this one, suddenly the background looks sort of pink and there's all kinds of little dots on it. That's because this particular um, sample was taken from a patient sample. So in other words, this, was, uh, this is some kind of body fluid that was smeared onto the slide. So there's material, there's molecules in the fluid and those end up taking up a little bit of the stain. But the reason I wanted to show it to you is because you can see the interesting shape of these cells. These cells are much bigger than what we've looked at so far. Look at this cell, it's very long. And it has lots and lots of twists and turns in it. This is a spirochete. This spirochete is a pathogen called Borrelia burgdorferi. That's quite a name, right? Again, we're under the 100x oil immersion lens. So we're at a total magnification of 1000x. Does anybody know what Borrelia burgdorferi causes in uh, humans and other animals? By any chance? <laughs> anybody ever heard of Lyme disease? Yeah, that's the um, pathogen that is a scourge here in New England um, because it causes Lyme disease. Um, if you've ever had Lyme disease or if you've ever known anyone to have it, um, it's painful. Um, it's problematic and it can cause long-term complications in some people. It is treatable though, thank goodness. If it's caught early, it can be treated with antibiotics. And this is, that, is the nasty little organism that causes it. And this one is called a spirochete. Now, as I said a minute ago, if you called this, if you looked at this slide, say on a lab practical exam, and you told me this was a spirillum, that would be fine too. It takes a lot of practice to, to be able to distinguish a spirillum from a spirochete. This is a spirochete underneath an electron microscope. Look at the detail that you can see under the electron microscope. It's amazing, right? Remember, electron microscopes are able to see a lot of things that we just can't see under a light microscope. I like this image because it really drives home just how many twists and turns are in this cell. This is one cell. And this cell is very flexible. It's very um, flimsy and flexible, like a piece of spaghetti which is why when you make the slides, you get you can see these cells are in all different sort of configurations. They're all bent in different ways. They're very, very flexible, these spirochetes. Now take a look at this one. This is spirilla. This is not a spirochete species. This is a spirilla shape. The only thing I want you to notice here is there just aren't that many twists and turns in these cells, right? See, th this thing is definitely wavy. It's definitely longer than a normal rod looks. And it's got these waves in it. It's got these twists in it, but there aren't nearly as many twists in this as there are in something like this. This is a spirilla shape. Questions, comments. 
So again, one of the features that we look for when, remember what, we, what we're often trying to do in the microbiology lab, at least in, um, in labs that are associated with hospitals and doctor's offices, we're often looking at a specimen and we're trying to determine number one, if there are microbes in the specimen and number two, what they are. We want to identify them. And one of the very first things we do to identify them is look at their shape because we can tell um, a lot about an organism by what shape it has. And then we start going down a long list of other tests that we can do to help us figure out what genus and species we're dealing with. All right, take a look at this slide. I know this is hard to see, so I'm gonna make it bigger for you. This is a clinical specimen, and this is a wet mount. This was, this wet mount was made from a urine specimen. And what we did was we took the urine and we um, centrifuged it in the lab to create what we call urine sediment. We pulled all the solid materials out of the urine so we could look at them. And this is what we got. So again, this is a wet mount. That's why the cells are the same color as the background. What do you think? What kind of shape do you see there? Sorry, let me put it back up. What do you see for a shape here? Coccus. Yep, coccus again, very good. Circular, a circular shape, right? Notice that all the cells are the same size. This is a particular genus and species. This is some particular species of bacteria. I don't know what yet, because I haven't done enough testing, but this thing, this organism, they are all the same species. And so they're all the same shape and size. This is another clinical specimen. This is another patient urine sample. We are under the 100X oil immersion lens. So we're at 1000X total magnification. This is another wet mount. So the cells are the same color as the background, basically. What do you think about this one? Bacillus? A bacillus or a rod, right? Very good. Now, if you look around here, you can see um, right here, I think is a nice view. There's two rods. There's one right here and one right here. So there's two cells and they have associated with each other. They are lined up head to tail. Down here, this is probably a single rod. This one's probably another single rod. This is a single rod over here. I've got another chain or group of them over here. If you look at this right here, look at this thing right here. This almost looks circular, doesn't it? This, this almost looks like a caucus. But this is a good reminder to us that when we look at a wet mount or, or a smear, we have to always remember that these are three-dimensional cells and they're gonna land on the slide or on the smear in different orientations. Sometimes we're gonna be looking at them along their length. Sometimes we're gonna be looking at them end on. The example I like to use is a loaf of bread you can look at a loaf of bread from the side, right? And you can see all the slices in the bread. Or you can look at a loaf of bread end on, and you would only see a single slice, right? That's what's happening here. We're looking end on right here uh, at a rod. And here we're looking at two rods that are uh, lengthwise. So we do have to keep that in mind when we're examining slides. Here's another one, again, clinical specimen, urine sediment. 
Ah, we've seen something like this before. What do you think this organism is? Think this is bacteria? Is it fungi, the branching? Fungus. Yeah, this is a fungus. Um, you can see the branches. Remember, those are called hyphae. And you can also see these circular cells. These are yeast. So there's a yeast cell right there. Here's one right here. They're coming off of, they are budding off of the ends of the branches, the ends of the hyphae. These are yeast. It's actually super, super, super common to find yeast in urine specimens. Now, if I told you that this urine specimen was collected by the patient, so the patient went into the restroom and hopefully uh, used a little alcohol packet to clean themselves off and then peed into the specimen cup for us. And I saw this in the sediment. I would not rush. I would not rush to think that this patient had a yeast infection. In fact, this patient did not have a yeast infection in, in their bladder. This was a routine urinalysis. So where did the yeast come from? If, if there's no yeast growing in her bladder, causing an infection, why is there yeast in her urine? What do you think? Mm -hmm. Urethra or on the outside? Yeah. The, the reason there's yeast in that cup of urine is because she urinated. <laughs> she urinated into the cup. In other words, we didn't collect it directly out of her bladder, did we? <laughs> we allowed her to urinate. And you have to remember, urine passes down through the urethra. And then in a female, especially, it has to pass through the external genitalia. It has to pass by her labia. And, you know, hopefully she's done a nice job cleaning herself off. Hopefully as she's collecting the urine, she has positioned the cup uh, correctly, but it's very common for us to get a few cells that come off of her skin, not out of her bladder. The same thing happens with men when men um, collect a urine, a urine sample from themselves. Again, they're gonna try to clean themselves off as best as they can, but because they're urinating out through the urethra, which is not sterile, and past the skin, which is not sterile, it's very common for us to see a few organisms in the urine that came from the skin. Now you might say to yourself, well, gosh, how would I know then if a patient had a, a true fungal infection in their bladder? And the answer is, first of all, that it's unusual. Remember most human pathogens are bacterial or viral, but there are fungal pathogens. They're just not very commonly found. The way you would know if a patient had a true fungal infection in their bladder is because the urine would be loaded with fungus. You would see lots and lots of fungus in there. So if you find an occasional um, clump of fungus, if you find occasional yeast cells, that's generally considered contamination from the collection process. And that's what that one was. That was a perfectly um, healthy person who was just getting a routine urine, urinalysis done at a physical exam. This was nothing to worry about. I have one more slide to share with you today and that's this one. This did not come out of urine. This came out of what's called the Buffy coat from a blood sample. So take a look at this slide. This um, has a couple things on it um, that you might recognize, but a couple things that you might not recognize. Um, does anybody know what I mean when I talk about the Buffy coat? Have you ever heard that term before? Anybody ever heard that term before? The layer in blood? It's a layer in a blood sample. That's exactly right. When we collect blood um, in a collection tube, a glass collection tube, and of course there are many different types of collection tubes and they've all been treated with different chemicals for, so that we get different information 
from the blood sample. But there is a particular type of collection tube that allows blood to clot and separate. And what'll happen is all of the red blood cells will go to the bottom of the tube essentially. And all of the white blood cells will rise to the top. Any bacteria or other microbial cells that are in the blood, if there are any, will end up up with those white blood cells. And the reason we call it a buffy coat is because after the tube has clotted and settled, you'll see a whitish cream colored layer at the top. That's the buffy coat. And that's where the white cells are. And that's where any uh, bacteria or other microbes might be if there's a problem. So that's what you're looking at on this slide, on this smear. This is a buffy coat. So all of the white cells have been combined together. They've been concentrated into this layer. You don't see any red blood cells because those are down at those were down at the bottom of the tube. Look at how big these cells are compared to what we've been looking at today. These are eukaryotic cells. These are white blood cells. They are much bigger than bacteria or archaea or even the infinitesimally small viral particles. These are huge, relatively speaking, because they're eukaryotic cells and these are white blood cells. Some of these are called neutrophils, the ones that look like they have several nuclei in them. Some of them are called um, lymphocytes. Some of them are um, other types of white blood cells. So again, we would expect to find lots and lots and lots of white blood cells all together in the buffy coat. What we would not expect to find is this. These are bacteria. This is that horrible um, large <laughs> type of bacteria I mentioned a few minutes ago. I want you to look at this. These are rod shaped. They're associating in chains. They're also relatively enormous. This is that bacillus species I mentioned. This is one cell right here. Here's another one right here. And again, they're associating in chains. So they have, again, also been grouped up into that buffy coat. They've been, um, they've separated up into that buffy coat with the white blood cells. Now, here's a question. You think this patient is sick? You think this person feels poorly? This person has- Probably has bacteria in their blood. Yeah, this patient is very sick. This patient is close to death. This is a condition that we call sepsis. Sepsis means infection in the blood. Your body, the human body, I should say the animal body, is designed to prevent that at all costs, essentially. You, your white, your uh, immune system works very, very hard to survey the blood. And if any bacteria or any other microbes get in there, they kill them. So if you develop an infection in your bloodstream, you are very, very sick. This is called sepsis. And it is often a result of um, a long-standing disease process or a very severe disease process that's going on. Sometimes, for example, people who have pneumonia will develop sepsis or people who have um, some other terrible, um, uh, maybe a cancer, they'll develop sepsis. Um, the immune system simply can't keep up and um, the bacteria start to grow in the bloodstream. If that's not addressed very quickly with intravenous antibiotics, that patient will die. So yeah, we don't ever expect to see bacteria in the blood. It's a place that should be sterile under normal conditions. So just a couple of clinical samples for you to take a look at. We'll try to do that um, in these lab sessions together. We'll try to take a look at some actual specimens so you can um, you can see them. I'm gonna let everybody go though, cause I've kept you too long today. 
Um, I will see you on Monday for lab. Remember, you have an exam on Monday. You can certainly take the exam before lab or you can take it after lab, whatever works out for you. Um, if you have any questions or problems before then, just get up with me uh, through Blackboard, send me a message. Um, and other than that, I hope you have a good rest of the day and a good weekend. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll see you next time.